Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, whichever one suits you, uh, wherever you are in the world today. This is the third part of our latest series of vlogs from uh, TTC Games. I'm joined again by Jeff, who has told me he's not allowed orange juice because he's on video and he doesn't want to be seen drunk. Uh, I've got some coffee. Sit back, relax and enjoy. Um, what we're going to talk about, in between me having a cup of coffee, is... And it leads on from the last video. In that, we touched upon the fact it appears the Russians keep changing their policy in terms of the war with Ukraine. It has not worked very well for them, let's be honest. They started out pretty high tech and blitzkrieg or deep penetration, whatever you want to call it, um, mobile warfare. Now it seems to be World War One, and there's the odd airstrike here and there and missiles and God knows what. But it's not a consistent strategy for winning a war. There's not a single policy that appears to be being followed. And I can't make up my mind why that would be there. But we do know that this is not the first time it's happened. So over to Jeff here, because he's going to take you through a couple of things to do with the World War I submarine war that the Germans sort of started and then stopped. Right. The key thing to remember about the um, high seas fleet and U-boats is that the Germans don't really devote any serious strategic thought to how to utilize their U-boats until quite late in the day. The most that they get is, we'll park a couple of U-boats here, a few U-boats here, um, then the Royal Navy will run into them, we will sink some of their ships, and then um, enough of the Royal Navy Grand Fleet will be whittled down, we shall close with the high seas fleet, and High Seas Fleet will then blow Jellicoe out of the water. This is essentially their strategy in the first few uh, months of the war, and it fails miserably. What you effectively get is obviously Weddigan manages to take out uh, three armoured cruisers that are not moving. Well done. Um, obviously, HMS Pathfinder as well. Um, he, uh, you also get uh, a torpedo fired at, uh, I think it's HMS Neptune, uh, when he tries it again on the Grand Fleet exercising, and then HMS Dreadnought uh, spots him, alters course, rams him, and cleaves his submarine in two. Bye-bye, Weddigan. You also get um, <laughs> a couple of torpedoes aimed at uh, other ships, but the fact is the, um, it's very, the Royal Navy very, very quickly goes, well, let's move our ships at high speed, let's zigzag where we can, we have turbine dreadnoughts which are managed to go quite fast uh, and we'll surround them with destroyers where we can because logically if you have one ship firing at another ship uh, positioning a uh, smaller craft as either a defensive meat screen or as visual aids to finding these things and therefore avoiding them or ramming them because keep in mind a ship's bow is underwater so that's the best way to kill a submarine if it's submerged at that point in the war Put some destroyers between the ground fleet and any submarines. There you go. Don't need to worry about it. So immediately, the Royal Navy has almost adopted a convoy um, strategy for its primary force. Yeah. And that means that the Germans can't really touch it at that point in time. So at this point, the, the high seas fleet starts to uh, reevaluate. And therefore, they begin to wonder, well, what else can we do with these submarines? So they decide um that maybe they should try and take out some merchant ships part of the issue is the germans really they're not actually that worried about the grand fleet at this point they're worried about the 10th cruiser squadron which is in the north sea and the atlantic it's stopping ships reaching uh germany and therefore firstly germany is depriving itself is deprived of certain important materials but also food is increasingly difficult to come by because the German rail network is not adapted towards bringing in food from its fertile regions in the east to the west, whilst also moving troops around. This puts severe strains on their rail network. So they've got to get rid of the 10th Cruiser Squadron somehow. So they're always going to have the presence of the Grand Fleet in their mind somehow. They've got to find a way to get rid of that so they can get rid of the real threat. However, you do get some, be it Germans, being aware that uh, Great Britain is an island. She is importing her food and I think has been since uh, the mid-19th century. 
So if they're starving us and we're finding it difficult to get rid of their blockading ships, keep in mind that it's very difficult to find 20 or 30 uh, armed merchant cruisers putting her around in the deep uh, expanse of the Atlantic. So if we can't find those ships and we can't get to the Grand Fleet, let's get rid of their merchant ships around Britain. So you have this um, into 1915, they start deploying their submarines to try and take out merchant ships. And they do have a fair amount of success. Uh, I'm bringing up the um, Wikipedia pages relatively um, uh, accurate. Uh, so it says um, D, 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 20 U-boats uh, with that uh, uh, um, German U-boat force now primarily based at Ostend at this point. Um, and from February 1915, they sink about, uh, let's see, uh, do, 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 43,000 tons of shipping initially, and then it increases to 168,000 tons in August. 100,000 tons sunk per month. Right. Now, we need to keep in mind that, yes, this is very successful, but the Germans are losing submarines. You look at the first U-boat flotilla. By 1915, at the, the absolute least, it's lost half its number, mostly by being rammed and sunk uh, by ships that they've been attacking. They don't have that many U-boats, but they are starting to take some serious losses. So therefore, what you see is this, um, you, you're starting to see the sort of loss rate that's going to happen late in the war when the Allies get much more capable of killing U-boats, even if they're being deployed in quantity. Nonetheless, we have this supposed idea that they're worried about uh, offending the Americans. They sink uh, Lusitania, uh, 7th May 1915, and therefore you get um, the Americans making angry noises and the Germans stop. So we've already had two uh, redirections of policy at this point. Take out the Grand Fleet, doesn't work. Try and take out merchant ships. Oh, no, we're frightened of the Americans. Keep in mind that the other northern neutrals are worrying the Germans as well. You've got Norway, Sweden, Denmark. Do you want them invading Schleswig-Holstein? Do you want the Germans to have to redirect um, their troops to try and uh, deal with that problem? You probably don't. They're, they're already somewhat overstretched at this point. The Russians are still a threat going into 1916, looking, about, looking at the Brusilov offensive that we mentioned um, in the last few posts. So then the Germans decide, OK, we're going to call off that campaign. Let's try and take out the Grand Fleet again. This At this point, They've built quite a few more U-boats. It's 1916. They're in a slightly better position. They're almost at 100 or so U-boats, uh, losses accepted. They actually have a slightly better capability and a better chance to get the Grand Fleet to sail off a couple of patrol lines. But that eventually simply does not work because the Grand Fleet has now exercised enough with destroyers that the U-boats are mostly kept away. Um, they, uh, Jutland... They sail clean around these U-boat flotillas. Keep in mind that the U-boats coming from Wilhelmshaven, uh, as opposed to Flanders, still use their radio quite a lot. So you can still track them. So you can re redirect the Grand Fleet sometimes around them. Um, so you have that happen. 18th and 19th of August, uh, the IC fleet tries to lure the Grand Fleet again after having been pounded at Jutland. Um, and the high seas, so the Grand Fleet, does come close to quite a few U-boat patrol lines. Jellico does write how their torpedoes left, right and centre at one point, and uh, his ships are uh, just about avoiding them. But even then, they, the Germans take out two um, light cruisers. That's it, Nottingham yeah. and Falworth, gone. So, yes, you get Jellico going, OK, I won't sail past a certain line in the, land, in the North Sea. I'm slightly worried uh, that I'll lose more valuable light cruisers, blah, blah, blah. But the Germans go, well, this was meant to, you know, really smash the Grand Fleet. We've built 100 U-boats. Why have we failed again? OK, we're not going to risk the high seas fleet again. Keep in mind that we, in turn, our submarines are hitting German ships. And um, the, uh, the Germans have a battleship torpedoed on the 19th of August or, or a cruiser. I can't remember, but it frankly doesn't matter. Yeah, this we, we, we actually had a chat losing. about that on the phone, guys. And I was yeah. very surprised at how effective the Royal Navy submarine force was at inflicting damage, maybe not sinking stuff, but inflicting damage in German capital ships. Pretty much every yeah. time they went out to train, something got torpedoed, which yeah. kind of does lock you in port. Um, you know, it, it, this fascinates me because 
I know from having read about who ran the World War II German war economy, it was essentially the same people that ran it for Hitler that had run it for the, the Kaiser. And an awful lot of the horrors that became the Holocaust and the General Plan Ost, etc., uh, a lot of that is derived from the World War I exploitation of occupied Ukraine and Poland by the Germans. And it, it sounds terrible, but there is a precedent which I wasn't aware of. And this flip-flop that, that Jeff's talking about has another sort of Maybe a successor, and it's the way the Luftwaffe tried to fight the Battle of Britain. Um, a lot of people will say, oh, well, you know, that's this, that, and the next thing. There was actually reason behind what appears to be madness. The RAF number that we all see is about 690 odd planes. 693, 695, 690, it depends on the source, but it's somewhere just about 700 single engine fighters. I can tell you that number's wrong because we do actually have documentation that suggests that the reserves were not included in that. So you can add at least another 30, 40% on um, in terms of air crew and actual aircraft in all the far, in all in the full strength area fighter squadrons. That's all by about five. We've done a lot of digging into this, and it tends to that tends to reinforce the German experience that every time they tried something, there was always an interception. So what they needed to do was try and kill the fighters. Because without killing the fighters, the bombers can't then go and knock back the air bases and the communications nodes and so on that were, had to be done to enable Operation Sea Line to really work. So if you consider that the RAF wasn't just 690 odd planes, if you then consider that some 50 odd squadrons of RAF aircraft were shipped overseas, between June and September of 1940. But two thirds of them, so you know, went to the desert and to Africa, and the balance went to the Far East. If you have a massive shortage of air crew and planes, which is what the story behind the Battle of Britain is, you don't do that. <laughs> you can't, you need them. The reality is someone somewhere kind of knew that it was parity at worst in terms of the one thing that actually gets you air superiority, and that is fighter aircraft. Now, the Germans initially started with Frejag tactics, so the bombers would go towards the target, and about 40 miles ahead of that, the fighters just range freely, hoping to catch the RAF and bounce them. That was very, very effective. But because we had proper ground control intercept, the guys who knew how to fly a fighter plane talking our fighter pilots onto their bomber stream and trying to get round because they knew from the radar plots kind of where these free jagged assets were. An awful lot of the, the bomber guys were saying, wait a minute, where's our escort? We're getting taken apart here. This is crazy. Now, the Germans have a number of problems here. You take a look at the design of their aircraft. They've got glasshouse noses. It means you can see a lot. It's it, it improves crew morale, everyone's crammed forward in that little area, everyone can talk to each other, yada, 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 all good stuff. Until someone sprays you machine gun fire and maybe one crew member gets wounded badly or someone gets killed. Um, that meant that the bomber morale went through the floor real fast. And there's some information in the German histories that we've got that implies that the Luftwaffe morale started to break after week one of the Battle of Britain in the bomber units. They apparently put ground crew in as machine gunners and so on. And the ground crew themselves were cutting holes in the fuselages to add more guns. And these became fuel modification kits, which you, they, they were told to do it because they needed more defensive firepower. That makes sense if you think about it. So all the changes that the Germans did, heading the sector fields, then trying to hit basically any airfield and then pounding on uh, certain industrial targets, whether it was Supermarine in Southampton, whether it was the docks, whether it was going and bomber, bombing Vickers over in Bristol and so on and so forth. All of that kind of stuff was all designed to force the RAF to get into the air to give their fighters a chance to shoot them down. Now, when the Germans completely by accident bombed part of London, Winston Churchill said to Bomber Command, go bomb Berlin. And other than Goering from that day onwards being called Meyer, 
a Jewish name. <laughs> you said if, if the British bombed Berlin, call me Meyer. Well, yeah, we did. Um, and bearing in mind, Jeff and I are both British, so you know we're going to say we did, of course. Um, that bomber command raid was entirely ineffectual. It did virtually no damage, but it also created a political imperative because Hitler, understandably, was a bit embarrassed by this. He was actually in a meeting with a guy called Molotov when it happened. It didn't look very good. <laughs> Oh, the bridges are beaten. Oh, why are the air raid sirens going off, dude? You know, it doesn't really make sense. So he said, well, retaliate. Send a lot of bombers over London, bomb London. And the Luftwaffe had already been looking at this because it worked at Warsaw. It had worked over Rotterdam. And to some extent, it worked with the terror bombing over France that it put a lot of political pressure in people to make peace or at least consider getting out of the war. Unfortunately, it meant that the big wings, which had been effectively ineffectual from the north of the Thames, where an awful lot of fighter squadrons had been moved in any case, but not because there was any real threat, it just meant they were actually higher up and they intercepted the incoming bombers. It just meant that the RAF had a field day. We were for the first time able to put six or seven hundred aircraft up to intercept these raids, which were about a thousand planes. That's two thirds, essentially, of the inbound force. The inbound force was about two thirds fighters. It's a one to one match. And that is really difficult then for the Germans to protect the bomber force. And please bear in mind that the Luftwaffe has a different purchasing policy to that actually run by the British and the Americans during the Second World War. Germany was not rich. People think Germany was rich and amazing engineering and all that. And you've probably got a BMW or Mercedes or an Audi or a Volkswagen car, right? Because they're brilliant. I don't. I won't buy them. It's political. That's just me. I just won't do it. Ignore me. Don't buy what I buy because if it goes wrong, it's very expensive. But they're very nice. And Jeff can probably vouch for that because I think you've been in a couple of them now. Anyway, so, so, so you know. So and Jeff has got a Volkswagen Polo, for Christ's sake, because it's a good car, right? But the bottom line basically is the British and the American Air Forces took the view you buy a plane, you've got to keep it serviceable. Serviceability was the thing. And if you read Winston Churchill's comments about what's going on in the Middle East and the Far East, why is serviceability rubbish? The reason was not enough spare parts and ground crew. So we tended to buy one plane and enough spares for three planes. And over time, they got the logistics set up properly. And all of a sudden, we had a very high serviceability rate in all our squadrons. So out of the 20 odd planes in a squadron uh, towards the end of the war, maybe 18 would fly in every day. That's a very high serviceability rate. And if you think about what happens nowadays with Typhoons or F-10 or F-20 series, or F-30 series fighter aircraft, the downtime's quite high on them unless you're willing to spend a vast amount of money in spare parts and our politicians unfortunately won't. I'll leave that for another rant some other day. Germany was answering to a guy who was a detail freak, but he believed in ultimate production. And Heller wanted to hear a big number. So the Luftwaffe had a limited production base. They could only work two, not three shifts because of machine tool limitations and manpower limitations and so on and so forth. So what they did was they bought three planes and only one plane's worth of spares. And we've got statistics for the ME109 that suggests that up to 55% of them never even fought because of a hard landing or a bit that broke and they couldn't repair them. Airfields in Sicily were covered essentially in written off German aircraft that the British were able to repair because we had a spare part that fit and make the damn thing work. They never flew them. But we took them back to Britain, we gave them to Americans, the Americans did the same thing, and we test flew them to work out how to beat them. So that chop and change you see there in, in, the, in the strategy, if you like, of, of, of the Luftwaffe was actually a good idea, in theory. If we hit targets, they've got to defend, the fighters come up, we can shoot them down. Too bad there were more fighters, and bear in mind, fighter command almost doubles in size through the Battle of Britain. So yes, we're putting Tyros in planes and sending them up, and a lot of them were shot down. But fewer of them were dying, thank God, than was required to essentially run the RAF into the ground. That creates a really massive problem for the Germans. 
because politically, because Goring had essentially said, we can do this, and Hitler said, you will do this, it was very hard to suddenly go to the boss and say, boss, we can't do this. The Stuka units that were available at the beginning of the, the Battle of France, by the time they were withdrawn, after the first fortnight of the Battle of Britain, were down to about 80 planes from over 300 available. The bomber groups were losing, say, one plane over Britain, but two or three in every mission would be written off when they landed because of accumulated damage that they could not repair. So if the RAF shot down 25 planes, roughly 100 planes were written off that day. So the Luftwaffe was actually running out of planes. And when it went into the Soviet Union in 1941, it was actually smaller than it was at the beginning of the battle for France. Kessel Ring likened it to a blanket that was a bit too small. You'd pull it to cover up your chest, but your feet would be cold. So you get your feet warm, but your head, but your arms exposed. They could never really cover their territory with proper air cover. And that's shown quite heavily when you dig into the Eastern Front in particular, because it only ever had in World War II. At its peak, 60% of the German Air Force, generally speaking, it was less than 50% was in the East. The balance, so you're aware of the Luftwaffe, was either in the Mediterranean or fighting the British and the Americans over the UK. I could say against that if 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 you if that's OK, because that is basically what happens to the high seas fleet after 1916, because one of the reasons the British submarines kept hitting German battleships whenever they left the Jade Rose or wherever, she had detached a flotilla or so of destroyers down to Flanders, which meant he never had enough to cover his battleships, which meant we could get uh, in amongst the formations. Interesting. Keep in mind that um, during the, oh, let's see, the October action, I think. No, um, the November 1916 action, when he loses two battleships at once, HMS J-1 fires a 4,000-yard torpedo shot, uh, which I think is relatively good for a submarine um, yeah. at, of, the, of the time. So not the lack of destroyers leads to the lack of battleships. Also keep in mind that two German battleships develop propeller problems going into 1917. So you've got two being repaired and two, sorry, two being repaired from torpedoes and two being repaired from propeller problems. That's basically an entire squadron that's out. There is a reason why the Germans don't do a huge amount with their fleet in 1917 in the North Sea. It's not just operations in the Baltic. They simply don't have the ships to do anything against the Grand Fleet. Do you know, so that's ultimately... actually, again, that's something that comes into World War II. And we keep hearing about how marvellous Bismarck and Tirpitz and Scharnhorst and Gnesen are. And I'm not going to get into a qualitative discussion, but when the British sent the home fleet to sea, consistently in World War II, it would have between six and 12 destroyers available. That was the rock bottom minimum, and it was usually 24. For the home fleet. And when we did these convoys up to Murmansk, particularly after PQ uh, 15, there would be 30 plus escorts, not all destroyers, but mostly fleet destroyers, as well as a heavy covering force, which by the way, for that operation, almost never had destroyers attached. It'd be a battleship and or two and one carrier normally sometimes a cruiser <clears throat> the reason we didn't send destroyers with it because the destroyers were the fighting escort with the convoy and the submarines were not able to essentially engage the speed at which the heavies were moving because they were steaming at 25 30 knots all the time they didn't slow down they zigzagged and they observed complete radio silence and time and time again if a german recce plane found them the submarines couldn't engage and any German heavy units would have to retreat because they were outgunned. The one time it wasn't the case was Knight's Move, which was going to be Turpitz and Scharnhorst, Lutzow, I think Shear, certainly Hipper, and about 12 or 14 German destroyers were meant to attack PQ-17. Hmm. Now, the reason they returned to base was essentially 
either lousy navigation, it's hard to tell, or more, much more likely, just really bad charts because several German ships ran ashore, uh, were quite badly damaged, and then obviously in dock getting repaired for a while. Simply put, it took about 20% of the escort force from the heavies away, and they didn't dare go at sea because they knew that the British had submarines up the Norwegian coast as a patrol line. And they were going to have to sail through that to get to the convoy. Now, if Dudley Pound hadn't scattered PQ-17, the catastrophe we all know that happened would not have happened. Just so you all know. But the interesting thing is all these policy changes we're talking about are actually driven with good intentions. Nagumo's mess at Midway. If you read Shattered Sword, by Parnell and Parland, fascinating book. The Americans were inside the speed at which he could take decisions. Not because of some terrible incompetence. I mean, Nagumo is not the greatest carrier, I won't be fair. Ozawa is a much better guy for the job. And if you take a look at the lethality of his operation, the Rejo in the Indian Ocean, and then the frankly abortive operations that most of Kido Bitai undertook for months, under Nagumo, you, you might actually get where I'm coming from. That's easy to find. Go and look at it in Wiki. It's pretty good. Go and take a look at it elsewhere. Azawa was an artist with carriers. And he did a tremendous job at the Philippine Sea getting his licks in first. He did it again, interestingly enough, at Leyte Gulf and made Halsey look like a bit of a wally. You know, but the bottom line is Nagumo was screwed at midway because the Americans were inside his decision making process just and no more and he was constantly distracted by ground or by airstrikes from ground land-based air power at midway now the japanese were winning their fighters were shooting the hell out of the poor american airmen who with huge heroism pressed home attack after attack in the carrier group and hit nothing i believe the americans lost about two or three hundred aircraft in those land-based airstrikes pretty much every plane in midway was fired off and almost all of them were shot down the US carriers, though, weren't detected till very late in the day from the Japanese perspective. And he basically had been under round the clock airstrikes or what it felt like for about four or five hours before he found the carriers. And by that point, the Americans had found him and already the airstrikes were in the air. He was essentially completed the rearming to go back after midway. Because he knew he had to take that out. He had to neutralize it so the amphibious assault could go in. He hadn't done it with his first strike, and that was proven by this drip, 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 drip of constant airstrikes. And he kept changing his mind, not because he was useless, but because the information and advice he was getting from his so-called experts and from his intelligence people who were saying, wait a minute, boss, we found these ships. Hang on a minute. We need to kill that. We need to neutralize that as well. And as he his information supply was a bit slow, so he didn't ever have a chance. And there's a finite period of time it takes to change operational uh, targeting, as it were, of these aircraft that he's got on his decks. Um, and the other thing is all these little drip, 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 drip airstrikes meant that the carrier air patrol, the cap, was constantly, the combat air patrol was constantly cycling, being refueled, rearmed, put straight back in the air. And if you ever watch the movie Midway, and I don't mean the really awful one done a few years ago, I mean the original one from the 1970s, with, I think it was Charlton Helson and, and so on, ignore that some of the rather dodgy, trying to be politically correct stuff. It shows Nagumo quite well because you can see the quandary is put in by the changes in decision making process by information coming in in actually a very confusing way. So this Russian mess in Ukraine may well, at the highest level, be well-meaning. It may well be that people said, boss, let's try that. OK, let's do that. Wow, that was close. That almost worked well. Let's take the good stuff back out because we don't want to lose it. You know, we don't leave it in Ukraine. Let, let's get it out in case NATO does something. We all know NATO is a defensive alliance. So we're not going to go to war against Russia unless we are attacked. 
But they don't seem to think that. And actually, when I speak to all these Russian people, they all believe NATO's the big bad aggressor. We're not. We've never actually attacked anybody as NATO. NATO may have come in after the Americans did something dumb in Afghanistan um, and so on and so forth. And, and we may have gone in as NATO and, and tried to deal with the mess in Bosnia. But that's largely a, a reaction to something that's already happened. So we have this situation where the Russians have tried one thing, tried another thing. They, they've tried all kinds of different things. They haven't stuck to one particular strategy. And I'm wondering if that is why this is dragged on. And I'm wondering if what Jeff and I have discussed, you can see that the, the submarine flotillas do that, do this, do that, do that. And eventually it gives the Americans really an excuse to get in the war. That, by the way, partly is a Monroe Doctrine. Mm. And it's also a failure of um, diplomacy by Wilson in 1916, because he was trying to push a peace treaty then, which all the powers appear to have wanted. Uh, and it was the financial straightening of, of the British Empire, which was paying not just for our own war effort, but for the bulk of France, pretty much all of Russia, all of Italy and all of Serbia. We also paid the whole of Greece's war effort to a large extent. The Germans by that point, by the way, guys, were paying for Austria-Hungary and were paying for Turkey as well. And nobody in Berlin and nobody in London wanted to continue the war. But you can't be seen with half a million casualties by that point in the British Army and over a million German losses. You can't be seen to back off. Wilson should have pulled the plug financially and he didn't. He didn't have the balls to do it. And that comes back to bite America in 1917 when public opinion starts to get a bit annoyed. And more importantly, the Monroe Doctrine says the US will actually impose its will in specific ways. And initially it was essentially they'd let the British go and deal with most of their problems at sea because their navy wasn't big enough. So when the British couldn't protect American shipping, from U-boat attack, they had no option but to get in the war. Right, it's not a political misjudgment on the German part. They're interested in strangling Britain. And they did quite a good job in 1917, as I understand it. They did a better job then than they did in World War II. I just want to know what would have happened if the British had just dropped their fear of browning shots drop their fear of a submarine torpedoing eight merchant ships at once or whatever. I want to know what would have happened if the British had just gone, right, 1914, let's just start convoying straight away. Because then the Germans would have had some serious, serious difficulties finding those convoys. And then it would have been like the Germans trying to hit the Royal Navy. Oh no, we can't do it. There's just too many destroyers stopping us. Mm. I wonder, because the first thing the Germans the Germans do wonder about how to control their U-boats in a large group to find the convoys. Um, their first attempt uh, controlling them from a U-boat at sea doesn't really work. Um, they do ponder utilising one of the larger U-cruisers with a nice wireless set off the east coast of England. Uh, I don't think they ever put that into practice. Um, and obviously Dönitz is starting to think uh, after the war, let's do land control. Um, the effectiveness of which uh, one can ponder. Um, but at the end of the day, I would like to know, I'd love to see um, someone's detailed speculations on what would the Germans have done if they'd found that the convoys were hard to find, hard to hit. Yeah. And so the U-boats effectively, uh, <coughs> what are they going to do? You see, throughout the whole war. Two, the British convoyed from the get-go, except for, for faster ships. Mm. And those ships which couldn't keep up with the convoy and strangled. Mm. Um, there was also some very slow ships, were too slow for convoy, blah, blah. But for the most part, the bulk of shipping disappeared from the seas, went into convoys, and wherever possible, we escorted them. And it took a while to build it up. Um, at the beginning of the war, German U boat successes were pretty paltry. Mm. And it built up into the summer of, and, and then the autumn of 1940 during the invasion scare. And I, I say scare, I never think there was that much of a threat from a German invasion of the UK. 
And what that did was it took between 80 and 110 fleet destroyers out of the escort groups and basically dumped them around ports in Britain. Right? And that is when you consider most convoys through the war had between four and six escort vessels at sea with the convoy. So an awful lot of convoy escorts not available. Hmm. Now, when those ships were released from convoy escort, which happened through the autumn or the late autumn and most of the winter, slowly but surely the ships were transferred back to Western Approaches Command and Southwestern Approaches. Um, the U-boat war in the North Atlantic was officially cancelled in April of 1941, guys. They transferred the U-boats from the primary convoy routes with attacks off of Iceland. They transferred them down to the South Atlantic and the Central Atlantic because basically attacking a convoy was not a good idea by that point. And the Germans were starting to get towards an unacceptable exchange rate of, you know, one U-boat, say, for three merchantmen, had dropped down to one U-boat for one or two merchantmen. And every time that happened, Donuts pulled the submarines out of whatever area and put them somewhere else. And the provision of U-cruisers and mine-laying U-boats and then the tanker U-boats, all of which had a high fuel capacity and refuel multiple attack boats, essentially meant that operations off the US East Coast and the Caribbean then became a very lucrative thing for about six months. But it should be noticed that only in four out of 27 months did the Germans get to a point in the in between 1939 and the US entry in the war in 1941, where they actually sank more tonnage than Britain built. And only in one month the rest of the war, and that was November 1942, did they manage to sink more than America and Britain were building. If you dig through various books in the Second World War, at least 95%, and some sources suggest 98% of convoy vessels and shipping of all types reached its port in a timely and safe fashion. That is the definition of success. It's one of the key reasons why in World War II, despite the loss of millions of tons of shipping over the peace course of the war, the U-boats didn't end the war in Germany's favor. And I'm, I'm thinking what might have happened in War I is exactly that outcome, but quicker. Because it would have driven, there would have been an impetus if they were going after the convoys and the odd success would inevitably happen as inevitably happened during World War II. The British would have thrown a lot more economic resources at the provision of technology to try and stop the U-boat menace. And the big one is, would sonar have become a thing quicker? Because I'm pretty sure they were looking at how to sound detect a submerged boat. Hmm. The problem, the problem is that the U-boats are so completely taken by surprise. Keeping in mind the U-boats will not have any hydrovert, well, they might, but they won't be particularly uh, impressive. Um, I don't think the I think convoy would have hit the Germans far harder for far longer than happened in the Second World War before they sort of recover and try and, you know, try different things and what have you. So I wonder if it might have actually stagnated Royal Navy technology to a certain extent because the Admiralty will go, well, you know, our merchant ships are doing fine. Um, the, the German whenever the Germans find them, one merchant ship, maybe two maximum being lost from these convoys. We don't need to worry about this anymore. Problem solved. Keep in mind um, <clears throat> how when the British really needed an anti-submarine mine, they captured a German mine intact and they wasted a year trying to improve the damn thing until someone in the Admiralty went, look, guys, just deploy the damn thing, use it. So I'm kind of torn. I think to a certain extent, the Royal Navy might have been uh, more lackadaisical than actually doing anti-submarine technologies had the convoys been implemented earlier. Um, but then what I want to know is, would the Germans have deployed their submarines for anti-fleet work for longer? And therefore, how would that have gone? Because while the Germans do deploy 20 submarines off uh, the English coast and elsewhere uh, to try and uh, get uh, the Royal Navy 
after Jutland. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, that doesn't work particularly well. I do wonder, have the Germans uh, deployed, oh, let's see, so they have about 100, so 120 submarines uh, when they start the um, final really big anti-submarine camp, uh, anti-merchant ship campaign. So 120. So let's say about 50, 70 submarines in the Atlantic patrol lines. But then the Royal Navy was pumping out destroyers by that point. So I can see a sort of, a sort of it's almost like, um, you know how we discuss that submarines almost like mobile defence turrets at this point. They can't mm. keep up with ships. You have to deploy them in advance. It almost feels like you'd have destroyers sailing over these patrol lines and fighting them, almost like a land battle in a really, really weird way. When you look at the top down strategic map, you'd have these sort of mobile elements coming up against the immobile elements. Um, but even then, if Jellico, so long as Jellico or BT were smart enough in maneuvering the Grand Fleet, I think even that wouldn't have been particularly effective. What the Germans needed were more battleships. Better naval intelligence, more light cruisers. Get those three, and then they can start to be a challenge for the Grand Fleet. But at it, that... might be, it might be useful, guys, to know that the British invented modern sonar in 1916. Hmm. Prototypical testing started mid-17, and it started to be deployed in late 1918 as prototypes. And... Mass production started between the wars for the Royal Navy on the A-class destroyers. Now, if you go after merchant shipping and Britain's starving, they're going to throw money at this much quicker than they did. And in World War II, we went from, hey, here's some radar that massive great big tires to something that fits in a small aircraft in two years. It's amazing what happens when you throw unlimited money with enormous government priority at a target of that type, if you ask me. Just a little thought out there. Um, yeah, anyway, so, you know, <laughs> sorry to interrupt, Jeff. <laughs> I probably wrecked your fine, fine. chain of thought. I, I waffle on too much, John, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Anyway, guys, I think we should probably not listen ahead. We've been here a lot longer than we thought we would in this one. It's actually a fascinating series of topics because there are other campaigns, there's other military operations that we can talk about in this thing. We might well revisit it in due course. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed us just having a chat because this time, these three things that we've done this time, we haven't actually planned, um, mainly because we've both been so busy, lots of things going on, as you know. Um, Jeff is very close to full OB creation for World War One. We need to light a fire there, Jeff. We need to get that started, you know. <laughs> and I'm, as you know, guys, we're, we're in proofing on Balkan Fury. We're in, we've proofed Madagascar. We're, we're kind of battering our heads off a brick wall with Watchtower. But once we crack the code in these destroyers, that will come forward real fast. You know now, Vengeance has had a lot of work done on it that you maybe weren't aware of fully. And I think uh, you're also aware that the software project's had a number of breakthroughs and we're bringing in people who are going to expedite that. And if you want to get involved with anything that we do, um, I'm going to ask Andrew to put our info at tkc-games.com email address in, in the comments box down below. Get in touch. You never know if you want to get involved. If you want to help Jeff look at um, World War One, especially if you know a lot about Air Forces might be worth having a wee chat with you. Um, if you want to express deep concern about our complete lack of understanding um, of something that we've spoken about, please feel free to challenge it. But you better have some information to back that up, some sources, because we do have an awful lot of sources. You can see some over Jeff's corner there. We've got a lot more, particularly for World War II, and my team that we've been working with, I think we're up to about 6,000 books and God knows how many websites and whatnot that <laughs> Corey has printed out. Um, I believe he buys paper by the container load and he just runs a laser printer all the time or something because he's a bit strange that way. Uh, but yeah, thank you for watching it. I hope you've enjoyed it. Like and comment down below. Come and see our websites, tkzi-games.com, uh, sixdegreesgame.com. And uh, we'll be back soon. Thank you very much. Have a good one, guys. Bye-bye.